Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the special presentation offered to you by Casa Italiana Drilli Marimont at New York University and the Center for Contemporary Opera. We are delighted to partner with the Center for Contemporary Opera to preview you this brand new opera composed by our composer in residence, Roberto Scarcella Perino with the libretto by Martin Bolt. We were supposed to offer you the real thing the performance just this past summer here in Florence, where I actually am, at Villa La Pietra, the center of New York University in Florence. But of course, due to the pandemic emergency, that program was botched, but not the idea of offering you the full staging of the opera once time will permit. But we decided with Francesca Campagna, the general director of the Center for Contemporary Opera, to offer you this presentation because we believe that being part of this process of the creation of is almost as good at seeing, as seeing the completed work. Uh, we have a wonderful panel along with the composer and the librettist. We have a, a singer, a violinist, and of course we have Francesca Campagna. So the idea for this opera is a fantastic idea. It um, raised from a, a, a real fact that happened in Cremona, the city that you see right behind me, the city where I went to high school that I know very well. Uh, and I don't want to tell you anything about what triggered the opera because that's something that I want Mark and Roberto to tell you about. Um, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea to have an opera dedicated to a moment of silence. Already that, you got to love the paradox. And um, as I told you, we are bringing this moment to you, this moment inside the bird, the conception of an opera, uh, with the Center for Contemporary Opera. As you know, CASA dedicates a lot of energies, resources to the promotion of opera as the quintessential form of Italian art. And of course, we have uh, Adventures in Italian Opera with Fred Plotkin. We have the Opera Club uh, for students and young adults. Um, they all like, concentrate on the repertoire of Italian opera. But we also want to give the idea that opera is not a dead art form is alive and kicking and people are still writing opera and they're still writing great operas like the one we are presenting tonight and of course that's exactly the mission of the center for contemporary opera to perpetuate these tradition to keep it alive and to bring it to new generations so we are delighted to partner with the center for contemporary opera on this specific presentation and it's my great pleasure to invite Francesca Campagna, the General Director of the Center, to greet you and introduce uh, this evening. Thank you, Francesca. Hi, Stefano. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. And then it's always beautiful feeling home with uh, Casa Italiana that uh, has uh, this uh, special uh, attention to the music, in particular to opera. Uh, as you well said, uh, it's important to promote uh, opera to the community, but in this case, my mission with the Center for Contemporary Opera is to promote also artists, that living artists who uh, are working and creating new subjects. I start to uh, talk with uh, Roberto and Mark about um, sharing a project together. And then uh, when they offered this idea, I was very happy to join and be part of this, uh, this project that was commissioned by uh, NYU Florence. And then that Center for Contemporary Opera hoped one day to, to produce uh, the full stage here in New York. And then the message behind this, uh, this uh, wonderful story that you will know more later, uh, it's, it's, it's exactly one part of our mission because uh, the new um, mission of a CCO is uh, have, uh, focusing on subject of, of social relevance. And in this case, I found that in this particular moment for all of, all of us, uh, to to understand that the silence is part of our uh, life that can uh, give uh, occasion to think about many stuff and in, in this case silence is the key of uh, behind this beautiful story and fun story um, and then uh, to partner with the uh, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo is very important because um, 
talk about uh, um, a city that has this such wonderful history connected to this, the history of music uh, and focus on, of course, the history of uh, these beautiful instruments that is the violin. And this is also why we invited today one of uh, the best violinists, younger violinists in Italy. But uh, I think that to give more the sense of what we are talking about is the best way to leave the floor to our wonderful and beloved artists that are with us. And then I like to invite Roberto Scarcella Perino, the composer, and Mark Campbell, the libertist, to explain to us and tell us more about the sweet silence in Cremona. Ciao Francesca, grazie, and ciao Mark. Uh, Hi, How are you? <laughs> Very good. How are you uh, in New York? I, can, I see your apartment. Yes, this is my apartment. Where are you in this I'm moment? I'm in Fire Island. Um, oh. You can see the ocean behind me. It's a beautiful yes, season. Beautiful. Uh, and uh, no, it's cold and beautiful here and I'm, I'm, I'm working and we should talk about the opera. Um, I'm, For sure. I guess we should, I think that's why people are here. Um, I will start and just kind of talk about the story. They're more interested in you because you're the composer and you're Italian and I'm a dumb American. Um, although not so dumb, we just had a good election. Um, so I, um, this opera started, Roberto and I met many years ago, I think in the 1800s or something. And um, we, uh, we got along very well. And I loved listening to Roberto's music because it has such a strong sense of melody. He likes to tell a, a beautiful musical story. Um, and it's not that common. I've, I've worked in opera quite a while, um, but I should get to the story. Um, we had tried to figure out something for us to work on. And then I read this story in the New York Times about the mayor of Cremona imposing a moratorium on the city against noise, against any sound, while the violins, while they were being tuned because they were going to be recorded for posterity. So the mayor imposed a moratorium um, on sound and noise in the city. And I thought, oh, this is a great situation. This is a rich situation. This is a funny situation. To ask people in a city to be quiet, um, I'm like, a, I'm a New Yorker, so I know how absurd that idea is. Um, so I started thinking of a story um, that took place in an apartment building right near the museum where these violins were being recorded. And um, just thought of a few characters who lived, might have lived in this building. It's a purely fictional story. Um, and then to kind of add a twist to the story at the end, uh, we decided to show what it was like to have the luthier, someone who takes care of the violin, um, actually play it and have the voice of the violin be a singer. Um, so that the story is not lifted, is sort of lifted from something that's funny and a little quotidian and maybe a little pedestrian. It is something that says a little bit more about the power of music and even the power of silence. Um, Roberto loved the idea. I, I came up with the premise. I kind of gave him an outline and um, I wrote the libretto and then I handed it to Roberto. So talk about the music. And um, so at the beginning to, to have a, an opera written about silence scared me. Um, the, my reaction was, oh my God, well, I'm, I'm going to write a big uh, rest from the beginning of the end. But then of course, Mark's story was, was uh, really, really beautiful. And, uh, and he, the message was how the, um, you need silence to hear the music and not just music, also emotions and everything that uh, you have to be a good listener thanks to the silence. So the story, um, when, I, when, I, when I read the libretto for the first time, uh, there were some parts that, uh, of course, gave me a lot of emotion. And in the, I start to, re to write that part. Um, so Marx actually works with a lot of composer. I don't, I work with librettists. And he was explaining to me how the different composer react to uh, his librettos. So there are composers that are very, um, they, they start from the first word and they finish the last word. So they continue. 
and he explained explain better. So you, you explain me that uh, I work on, the, and it's true, um, on the heart of the story. So I like to take uh, like what emotions start like with my belly, you know? So I, with the uh, heart of the story and start to build everything um, before and after. And um, there is a part in the story where uh, finally, like the, the listening, the sound uh, of um, violin became like uh, um, after this long wait uh, of this uh, of the sound arrive and the world has imagined the music and when i read this part it was so uh, emotional for me and i start to write this part and then i built all the music uh, from this melody um, of course, uh, uh, the best part of the writing was to have uh, Mark uh, beside me all the time. Uh, that it was an experience for me, unusually and beautiful, because uh, I need always uh, um, to, uh, to have a listener uh, when I create. I don't like to create everything and then just, okay, listen to, and uh, how, how is this that? During the process, I like a confirmation, like somebody that say, um, you know, um, uh, that react to what I'm writing. And uh, um, uh, the best part of the process was actually the rewriting. With Mark, we did a lot of rewriting of the story because both of us agree that everything can be said in a better way. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, uh, communication through WhatsApp, <laughs> mainly. Uh, so we were reading a lot of, you know, writing a lot of time. Um, he, he, Mark is a, absolutely a person that knows music very well. I, I would say that he's a musician. So he totally knows uh, per perfectly how to uh, use the adjective to um, uh, make me understand what was uh, uh, in, in the character and also in the story. So the rewriting uh, um, uh, to arrive to a point where we were all, both of us, satisfied about the final product for final art. This story that Mark was explaining is uh, uh, also written in a, a beautiful way because it's like to enter in a museum to see paintings, each character has uh, his own uh, uh, story. So the structure is really beautiful and each character has his own structure. So the areas that he present to me, they were already um, telling us a story of the characters. Um, so uh, for me was writing, uh, um, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking like major areas like Mi Chiama Nome Mi, or um, uh, Manina, where the characters introduce themselves and they tell their stories. And this happened with this character that he uh, showed to me, like since the beginning, the um, uh, scene that, you know, he, he will tell you more about the character of Valentina or uh, Ettore. And then we have another pregnant woman that's Julia, uh, that our uh, uh, singer Jessica Fisher that she will sing for us tonight. Um, and uh, um, so, and then finally at the end, after you know them, you like them, you love them, or you hate them, it depends on the situation, you see them interact together. Um, another thing about the, the opera that I, I, uh, that I loved, uh, um, Mark gave me a lot of space to express music. Like the finale, this is yours. This is the moment where the violin and the soprano will sing. So here, you know, it's a moment where music speak. Um, there is a part also, a stage moment where the, 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 the actors, they fix their apartment at the beginning. So we decide also to have just kind of an intermezzo that is, uh, um, uh, that happened, you know, after the, 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 the prologue of the story. Um, uh, so I, I want to ask Mark uh, to, to tell us a little bit about e each characters of the story. Um, also, you know, um, describe them uh, with adjectives. Well, sure. Um, uh, yeah, um, the, the opera has six performers and it has eight, eight characters, right? Two, two performers double. Um, the, the character that Roberto, Roberto already mentioned a few characters, but the character that really ties things together is the character of Yassin. He is an immigrant um, 
who, um, second generation in, uh, immigrant, who has arrived in Italy and his job is basically to deliver flowers to um, Julia uh, in, the, in the apartment building where they all, that they all share. And um, that's basically his job. He connects all of these stories. And I chose an immigrant to do that because I, an immigrant who loves Italy, by the way, um, loves everything Italian. And um, I thought it was very important. I think that's where our two cultures connect, Italy and the US and many cultures around the world, where we, we want to figure out how to deal with, with refugees and immigrants to our countries and, and to, to, to make the society work um, with them. And so I thought that was a nice connection between our two countries. Uh, Yassin is a young man, he's ambitious, I adore him. Um, he's funny and um, strong and um, he has one moment of sadness where he talks about his parents um, and, and the difficult decision to move to Italy. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the first person he meets, um, it's, it's Ettore, yes? Okay, I almost said Ettore. Ettore owns a shop on the first floor and it's a shoe store. And he's not doing so well since this moratorium on silence because women are not buying high heels or anything that makes sound on the pavement, on the cobblestones in Cremona. So he's just kind of selling tennis shoes and he really regrets it. The name of his shoe store is Scarpa Diem. And I actually saw that name um, in Agrocento when Roberto and I were driving around Sicily many years ago. And I went, oh, that is such a name. I'm gonna have to remember that for this libretto. So he owns a shoe store. Um, another character in this apartment building is Valentina. Valentina is kind of a young woman. She's spoiled. Um, she's trendy. Uh, she unfortunately has a dog that she loves very much named Attila. And um, as you can imagine, Attila is rather tyrannical and will not allow Valentina to go to her yoga, her yoga class. Of course, she has a yoga class. Um, and um, that actually is an interesting story because Attila arrived later in the libretto. Um, we could, there was something missing in the Valentina scenes. And then I think Roberto suggested, why don't we add a dog? And, I, and my first reaction was like, oh God, that's gonna be so damn cute. But what if the dog is not cute? Then it's not cute. So, um, so we have a very funny comic scene with, um, with Valentina and Attila. Um, further up is Julia. And um, Julia is pregnant, and I mean very pregnant. And unfortunately, her husband is away. And so she's worried that she's going to have to conceive a child during this moratorium on, on silence. Not the best time to conceive a child, not only because of her possible loud noises, but because of the ambulance that might have to pick her up to take her to the hospital. So this is the, the last, the least convenient time for her to have a child. Finally, um, there's a woman named Mariolina and she's on the top floor and um, she's an elderly woman who really loves the silence. She does not have to listen to bad singers, street singers singing Puccini out on her um, sidewalk anymore. And she even says the rather daring thing of like, if this is my last day on the planet, it's not so bad. God can take me away on this day because it's a beautiful day and there's silence and I've lived life long enough. Um, so there's a little bit of sadness in that. All good comedy in opera, especially, has sadness in it. That's what makes it work, I think. Um, so those are the main characters in this apartment building. And then we kind of shift the story over to the museum where um, a violin is being recorded. And that's when we uh, look at the story of the luthier and the violin itself. Um, and I would say that is the moment in the opera where it's kind of Mozartian, um, where everyone is united by music, by, and music being the spirit of, of humans, of, of what we share together and what we can find together if we actually listen to music, what it is telling us and what, can we, what we can learn from it, our shared bonds. 
Um, that's the whole story, man. I, I think that was four hours <laughs> yeah, long. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, the music is the healer to everybody's problems in this case. And, uh, and it's represented by the violin that is uh, um, in Cremona. So the orchestration, uh, we decided to do a chamber orchestra, so very, very, very small. So it's divided in the strings uh, that, of course, we have the violin as a protagonist, but the viola and the cello and the bass. And then I have also um, the, the flute, the oboe, we call no English, and, uh, uh, and then we have the clarinet and the bass clarinet and the bassoon. So we have like four and four instruments. So a very um, uh, silence orchestra in a way, you know, very, very chamber orchestra. Also the idea of the chamber of the apartments and the intimacy of uh, each one. In, uh, in this, uh, you know, at the end of the story, you can see that you have current characters are super comics, but also characters that are like more uh, um, um, uh, serious in a, in a sense of ways, with some moment of your seriousness. So it's making like the opera uh, comic, but also um, uh, um, makes you think about, you know, life and many other things. Um, the process of the music, or to write for an orchestra for the fun part for, for me, we were super, super quick. Uh, I think Mark and I, are, I have this in common that uh, one idea uh, is more like thinking about and then choom, to put on paper, everything is like super quick. Um, so uh, uh, we had time to rethink about, you know, to make the stuff better. better. And um, so the final part of the opera um, I will not, you know, um, tell um, the end, but this is the opening with music. So there is a moment where finally the recording is happening. And uh, um, after this beautiful aria that Mark wrote about the, the Luther, uh, that is a, like a love uh, the declaration to the, to the instrument, uh, to his job, um, I had to write this big finale where the, the violin, who is actually a soprano, and we decided to have a soprano um, um, a lyrical leggero, like very with a high range. Uh, we found uh, one for Florence, is Giulia Peruzzi, who helped me also with vocalize and everything. But the main work that I did I, it was with uh, uh, my inspiration violin, that was Andrea Obiso. This is actually here tonight. I want to uh, ask him uh, like to be present right now. Um, eccolo qua, Andrea, that is in Rome. Oh. So Andrea, Ciao, Roberto, how are you? Ciao. Ciao. Andrea Ciao. is... Uh, awesome. Uh, I will introduce to Mark also um, Andrea. Andrea is an, uh, an amazing violinist. He's an enfant prodigy. He won uh, a lot of first prize uh, around uh, the Europe, around the America, everywhere. And I met him uh, through common friends uh, here in New York. But we are both Sicilian. And, and um, when you know this uh, opportunity arrive, uh, I asked him like to help me, um, you know, to verify everything that I was writing. I am a pianist, I'm not a violinist, and I need also to listen for creative reason, um, uh, Andrea. So Andrea, tell us a little bit about our experience. You were here with me. Yeah. In <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Exactly. I remember your apartment in New York. Oh, first, uh, I am I talking. Why you are in Rome? Yes, I am in Rome now. So uh, and, uh, I'm calling from because Italy. you are uh, because you are the first violin yes, of the orchestra. Because I, in Sicilia. I am the concertmaster <laughs> of the of the Orchestra Nazionale di Santa Cecilia. Uh, here we're playing at the Auditorium Parco della Musica. So uh, right now um, I'm I'm based here. Finally, I moved uh, two months ago to Rome and. Um, yeah, and I moved actually six months ago from the U.S. And last project I had in the U.S. was uh, exactly uh, this one with Roberto and Mark. And I was so uh, intrigued to uh, start working uh, on reviewing some of the very tough things that he wrote in the in the opera. Because in this in this finale, when finally the music uh, comes out from from the museum, by the way, I was there playing a concert with Giovanni Solima until I think it was two weeks ago. Uh, so I just been there in Cremona, the Arvedi uh, Auditorium or or uh, Stradivari uh, um, Hall, as they can call it. And Stefano for sure knows it better than 
uh, he knows the original uh, name. Anyway, it was uh, it was a fun uh, fun part because with Roberto and I, you know, we have a specific Sicilian way of communicating, as you can imagine. And we were thinking of like, okay, so you want this violin to to, to jump left and right for a second? We we took uh, some excerpts from concertos, from Veniaski, from Paganini, uh, from Ernst, and um, and then uh, in the end uh, is. Uh, is a burst of uh, lyricism, um, uh, so it, it's very, very well balanced, and we found uh, the best ways to uh, find this dialogue with the with the soprano. So, uh, Andrea, you you will play in Florence uh, um, uh, the performance I will do, like in Florence for sure, and uh, and your violin is also uh, yeah. something important, right? Can you? Yes. <laughs> We will, we will, I have it here with me. Um, wow. so, so, yeah, um, I was just adjusting it earlier, uh, just to um, underline the importance of a uh, luthier, as you were talking before. Uh, I'm learning a uh, lot from the luthiers I work with, so that in moments of emergency, uh, in moments like this, where you cannot really go meet someone and you need to be distant, I can follow certain instructions to adjust to the, the weather because these instruments are very very sensitive uh, uh sensi sensible to um no it's sensitive yeah to to the weather and and um and you know um and so this is a guarnieri del gesù uh, that was made in 1741 wow. uh, right in cremona uh, right near the where the museum is now uh in the center um and i will be playing with this uh in Villa La Pietra, uh, I hope. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can, can we say that? Can we say that? Can we say when the premiere will be for most likely or yes. around when? Yes. Most likely maybe next June. <laughs> yes. June. June. Yeah. Sure. Crossing the <laughs> Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> oh, no. No. Okay. I have a question for you. Our friends, our friends need to stay tuned about our upcoming projects. Sorry, go ahead. Of course. Yeah. Um, Andrea, I like I, I have a question for you. Like I when when Roberto and I we went with with my friend uh, Jeffrey John Davis who's um, runs in channel. Um, yeah. He arranged for us to the place in New York rare violins. It has a range mm -hmm. place. Um, to look at the lure, look at all these beautiful islands and like that. As he told me, and Roberto probably already knew this, but I didn't know it, that you you have a special relationship with your violin, like yeah. like he told me that that. Sometimes people get violins and that they feel that they have bad, I would use the word karma, or they have ghosts in them or something, and they send them back. And I yeah. thought it was a beautiful idea to view a musical instrument as having a spirit that you have to connect with. Do you agree exactly. with that? Exactly. Yes, exactly. That's why the idea of the character being a little bit met metaphysical, if you if we may say, and, and so that it can connect to the voice of my instrument, uh, I think it was perfectly fitting. And, uh, and I think um, for the purpose of what was the message that Roberto and you wanted to send, I think it, it, we found the best balance within what it is too violinistic and what it is maybe more relatable to the human voice. And so, and, and, and that was the whole work that we did basically, right, Roberto? We would find a rhythm with that would fit the instrument, but as well something yes. that you could that you could uh, find, uh, you know, um, away in the middle because somehow the part of Roberto uh, is very hard. It's very it, it requires a lot of uh, knowledge of the instrument, but at the same time it, it, it connects very well with the human voice and in, in this finale where all the potential will be because after the silence being the protagonist, you know, it will be. A Cremonese violin sound with a, with a, with a beautiful soprano. So it will be, it will be, it will be really uh, at the same time challenging and, and and beautiful because it will be a so sort rewarding. Of if I may chime in for just one second, following up to what Mark said, uh, but it's a question for for Andrea. Um, is it? Do I remember correctly that there is a part inside the violin that is called anima? Yes. Exactly. Good point. I was going to mention that. So, so because I remember, I remember, 
Bravo. So what, what, what Mark was saying, that there is this soul inside it. And I remember yeah. when I was in high school in Cremona, the big treat was they would take us to the uh, municipal palace before they built this beautiful violin museum that you see right behind me now with this very sleek design. The violins, the Guarneri del Gesù and the Stradivari and so on, they were all kept in the, uh, in the city hall, basically where the city council gathers. And the big yeah. treat was then when you went there to see the violins every morning, I remember this old professor, Professor Mosconi, would go there with two guards, uh, two municipal guards. They would open the, the, the cases, they would pull out the violins, and he would play like for five, ten minutes. And then he explained to us that otherwise the soul, l'anima del violino altrimenti muore. Otherwise yeah. the soul of the violin dies. I found it was so <laughs> fantastic. And now when Mark oh. was saying there is a spirit inside it, I suddenly remember <laughs> this professor whose job was to play every day all these violins so that their souls would vibrate and they would stay alive. I find it <laughs> extraordinary. Yeah. That, you know, we call it an it, instrument, but, but Andrea, you know better than everybody, it's far from an instrument. It's like it yeah. has its own so yes, I, 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 maybe this is a good excuse for me to let go my emotions with this one because um, uh, this violin uh, went through uh, a lot before being bought three times and then being played. Um, ex this exact violin um, was uh, bought in, in the 1970s and it stayed it was in in, uh, in Washington for for some some years um, at the Smithsonian. He, it was uh, uh, showed at the museum, and then um, at some point, someone else in New York, Jacques Francais, bought it for uh, his luthier shop, so to sell it because he found a lot of potential in this instrument to be played on. And so, but it, at the end of the story, basically, it wasn't played for about thirty years. And then five years and a half ago, I, I had the chance to meet my sponsor in Japan that invested uh, for many, many decades in instruments. And I had, and this was my first um, like antique instrument, let's say, to, let's say so, to, that I was playing. Um, and so I had the luck to know an instrument that would respond a little differently than, than a modern violin would. Of course, right? So you have to know you have to know the story, the life. Uh, exactly, the and I had to adjust to I had to adjust to it not life. being yeah. I had to adjust to it not being played, and so his resonance grew with my self and, and my first experiences with uh, such a Andrea, this uh, is actually violin. The, the luthier area, say, like l'area del lutaio that uh, Mark wrote, is all uh, about, you know, the, 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 all the people that play this instrument from centuries, from war, for all the, you know, the history that pass uh, in, the, in this violin. So it is actually beautiful what you say, because you reconnect everything what uh, um, yeah. Mark wrote. Um, so now I want to speak about this reading that we had in New York. Um, we were so before uh, the Nick attack, we had the time to have a recording that was sort of by uh, uh, Paolo Martino. Hello, music, and then uh, he his uh, apartment, and also, um, uh, you know, they, they ought to do this reading. We wanted, uh, with Mark, we decided to have everything to see, you know, if everything, everything was working, if we had to do like little changes. We couldn't play the ending because Andrea wasn't here, so we just stopped uh, until the area of the looter. Um, uh, but we, um, uh, we make this uh, small video with a prologue that, uh, um, uh, Mark had this beautiful idea about the prologue. Can you tell us, Mark, about the uh, um, opening of the opera? That is this uh, um, uh, the mayor that uh, uh, start to say everybody uh, about you know the um, to be quiet. And this is we uh, citizen uh, um, of Cremona that we um, ask about. So you have this idea to have this uh, this part kind of um, read by everybody. The, 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 the reason for the, for the, I would call it a prologue, as you would. Um, the reason for the prologue is to let the audience know context, to let them know what this is about. 
and we just have everyone come forward and read this edict um, by the mayor of Cremona. Of course, I made it up. And um, I think I remembered saying, this is very Gilbert and Sullivan. Don't give any emotion to this. It's all about the outward show of law and why this is happening. Um, we'll get to emotion later, but let's start the opera with something the, that- Yeah, the yeah. message that, I, that they, the idea that you had was like my musical translation was, uh, I don't want anybody to breathe. Like I want something yeah. to be read like from the beginning of the end, like and oh my God, what am I doing? And then we decide, you know, we found a solution. Yeah, so and I want find to... ways for singers to breathe. Of course, of course yeah. you have to breathe. They share the sentence but, between yeah. each other. But the idea but, is that this is one, con and by the way, it is one sentence. Um, and no commas. One long sentence, no pause. Yeah. No, no periods, no commas. Well, lots of commas, but but no periods. Yeah. Okay, so enjoy this video and then we can start again. Real people have been called on by our most beloved mayor, mayor to observe an ordinance. Ordinance. all excessive noise no, to the museum. and famous instruments recorded with the utmost vigor for all time and a set of includes what is by no means limited to intoning, beeping, shouting, ranking, clucking, calling, meowing, ringing, giggling, etc. that might be precipitated by construction, traffic, ambulances, search bags, This was a, a beautiful party. You could see from the food and everything that uh, <laughs> we had a great time. And, uh, um, and of course, I had the opportunity to know a lot of singers that I didn't know. Um, uh, Mark works more than me in the New York uh, um, Opera Award. So he, I, I could meet this amazing artist uh, um, that, uh, you know, they were like uh, really uh, learning everything and in few weeks, uh, and we had this reading uh, um, at the Casa of Paolo. Um, so um, the arias that I that um, we had to write, of course, they are um, different characters, and uh, one of the characters that was maybe I would say that was the most difficult aria to write for me was the one that uh, um, this character Julia Albertini is actually is called um, she la signora Albertini. Uh, she's alone in her apartment, pregnant, uh, waiting for this husband, uh, very emotional because of the hormones, I think, also for, uh, you know, she's uh, ready to, to get birth. And um, when uh, uh, the structure of this area is... Uh, really, really beautiful because uh, uh, I, I remember send me the text message, Mark sent me, do not do not write, do not start the aria, you had to talk with me, we had to speak like two hours about it. And it was true because uh, the aria is, uh, uh, is a kind of a crescendo or situation and there are two arias in one. So one is, um, it's like, uh, I, I would say, is um, a schizophrenic area. So you have one uh, part where you have the anxious uh, Julia, terrified for the birth, uh, angry about everything. So, uh, and the other one as a mother, uh, sweet, uh, devoted to the son that is, uh, his name is Federico, okay. is coming. And uh, um, so musically, to translate something like that uh, was, you know, to write like two different pieces and put them together. Plus, this is there is not um, a, 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 a organized. Of course, everything is organized, but it's like organized chaos. So you have sometimes the angry part is longer, sometimes it's shorter, and then it is like an explosion. Then she came back to be a mother. So um, we have actually here Jessica Fisher. Wait, 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 wait. Let, me, let me go back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because okay. um, what Roberto said is actually very, very important in that 
the text of this um, aria is there's a radical idea going on here in the text and the music in that the certain details of the story are delivered um, simply at the top. And then as you go on, the details expand and that turns into the story. And that's never been done in opera that I know of. You know opera better than I do, Roberto, but um, it's, it's a kind of a radical idea in storytelling. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say where you were segueing into is that we have um, the tremendous privilege of, um, of introducing Jessica Fischenfeld um, to sing this aria because uh, I had worked with Jessica on Stonewall and Jessica is one of the most brilliant actresses I have ever met and she can hit the notes. That's the thing. We, you know, in this country, in America, one thing that I think has been great is that we're training our singers to not just act and to deal and, and, to, and to work with the text and tell a story, but to also hit the notes. So we are tremendously privileged to have Jessica with us singing this aria um, because she not only hits the notes, but she hits the text notes. She tells the story to an audience in the most brilliant way. Where are you, Jessica? Thank you, Mark. Can you see me? So oh, Jessica. Yeah, like a vision. <laughs> wow, what an introduction. That was very kind of you to say. Um, sorry. I mean, it was, <laughs> you should be sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it was such a pleasure to, to sing in the reading, not only Julia, but Valentina as well. And um, the intro piece that you all have have seen by this point, um, I had to sing both parts. And so I was jumping between two lines and filling in the gaps. <laughs> so that was, that was an interesting challenge unto itself. But uh, I, I so enjoyed discovering these characters and it's, you have such a small time to be able to create this entire character within just one aria. But I think you both teamed up to give me so much to work with in that, um, you know, the, the schizophrenic nature of it completely encompasses how one would feel in this situation. You don't feel one way for that long of a time. I think, depending on what, what I'm thinking about, I, I think about the husband, I think about, oh, I'm so mad at him, but, but I love him and, but, oh, my child, oh, I have to comfort him and I have to do some sweeping. And I, I imagine that if I were in that situation, my brain would be in a million places at once. And I think that this, this aria is a perfect example of how that would manifest. So this is Julia's aria, No Federico No, in which she, in the middle of doing some housework, Julia, very, very pregnant, which I think you will all notice in the scene, um, is suddenly feeling bigger than normal kicks from Federico and she gets a little bit nervous because she's by herself in her house. Her husband is on a business trip. She's on this, she's, she's in this town where she has to be quiet. And everyone knows that when you're pregnant, <laughs> there's nothing quiet about it, especially when you're, when you think you're about to be giving birth. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs>
she is fantastic. <laughs> My God, I, I just I just love working with her. I really yes. do. And me too. And thanks for you know uh, bringing her in our project. Oh, so now that was an easy decision. Now is, um, uh, is you know we we hope to listen to this opera that we uh, we put so much uh, love and uh, you know fun like all the emotion to write this opera and it was a lot of fun to to write but also um so we are really waiting for to listen the um the entire production or with an orchestration and the setting and the, the costumes and of course uh, amazing artists uh, playing um, um so mark do you want do you want to say something to conclude the <laughs> evening <laughs> To conclude the evening, well, I, I I'd like to because I'm a writer. I also I I, I I'm all about structure. Um, but something that Stefano said at the beginning really was quite beautiful, and I think it connects everything with what we've been saying. Is that opera is alive and kicking? It's not a dead art form. As long as we tell relevant stories relevant to how we are living now, and they can be comic stories, they can be lyrical stories, we're still lyrical in spite of everything, all the horror in the world right now. Um, I, I really love what Stefano said that, that new opera is extremely important. And that connects us with Francesca and the uh, Center for Contemporary Opera, that their mission and the mission of many opera companies in this country and around the world is to keep opera going because the potential of words and music is something in terms of art that can keep us going and, and keep us enduring during these difficult times. Um, right now, it's it's been really hard for the last nine, 10 months uh, for opera singers, for, for musicians, for everyone that is involved in opera. And it is the most collaborative art form. That's one reason I love it so much. Um, it's been really difficult for us because we've had our lifeline cut out of us. Um, com uh, singers especially, suddenly we're getting emails like, oh no, that's canceled, that's canceled, that's canceled. And it's really difficult for us until we find a vaccine, which looks pretty soon, I think. Um, I want to encourage everyone to to support opera singers, opera companies as much as they can. It's a really hard time for us. And opera is essential. You all may think that, oh, it's not as essential as food or it's not as essential as rent. No, opera is essential. The combination of the voice, of music, of text, I put text last, which is not appropriate, but, um, um, is something that we need now. And so, gosh, just support opera until we get over this moment. And I think we will get over this moment. I mean, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rob, Roberto. I mean, you both are such a wonderful human beings, but in particular, you are a beautiful artist. And then what is really important to add to this perfect sentence that you, Mark, just said, is that we, that we are not artists. We do need you because we need the creative people in our life. We need to feed our life and emotion with the music and with the stories. And then today we have this fantastic opportunity that is the new music that live in composer and live in libertist can write for us to start to dream again and to see the hope after this pandemic. And as CCO, we will be ready uh, because I really believe that there will be a renaissance in arts after this uh, difficult moment. But even during this difficult moment, all of us are doing our diligence. We're all working so hard behind the scene 
because we will be ready to give again emotion to people, to gathering again together, go to the Casa Italiana that, that we will host again and again, um, events not online, but in, 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 in person event. And then we can wait finally to feel these emotions. And, and then we are preparing our, we are doing everything is possible to, uh, to, to, to maintain our companies alive. And then as Mark said, uh, we really need the support of everyone, not just the opera lovers. We need the help of the entire community because as you, can, as you see behind a project like this one, there is so much going on. There is so much beautiful messages behind that we do need to help for those projects, not only be created and commissioned, but also being produced at one point. And we will look forward to this in New York City and the rest of the United States. And the hope that this project will go around in, in, in this country and also in Europe, of course, where we'll premiere probably uh, next year. So thanks a lot to all of you. And thanks Casa Italiana, Stefano Albertini and his team to host this event and partner, partnering with me with not the only event we we had been uh, together but this is probably the, the the closest to my heart and then i hope that stefano will tell us the what uh, is the conclusion of this beautiful panel thanks to the the artist jessica is a, a wonderful beautiful uh, artist with a fantastic voice and then uh, uh, andrea is also uh, an artist I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm as, as well a Sicilian, so I'm close to this kind of language with the Roberto and, and, and Andrea, we share this, uh, the, 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 the land where we born. So Stefano, thank you so much. Thank you, Francesca. I think that after uh, Mark's statement, there is very little we can add. If not that now we really want to see Sweet Silence gonna premiere hopefully this coming summer on a date that is very close to me in the fantastic uh, surrounding of Villa La Pietra. And I thank my colleagues, uh, Larry Wolf and Perry Class, the directors of Anuin Florence for commissioning this work. And uh, so I can only tell you, I hope to see you all in Florence for Sweet Silence in Cremona. And thanks to Roberto, Mark, Francesca, Jessica, and Andrea for being with us tonight for a great panel. Thank you. Ciao. Oh.